Hello, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Lowenberg, uh, and uh, this is Arts and Sciences Telluride 2024. Uh, and the program, uh, this is a 12 laser zoom, Leonardo laser zoom series uh, over eight days. Uh, this is the third day today, and this is uh, laser zoom number five. And uh, to the last uh, four have been just inspiringly wonderful. And uh, I expect the same of this one. Uh, uh, just from the remarkable guests joining us uh, for the next hour and a half, a little more. And I'll introduce them now. Again, this program, for those who haven't tuned into the others, uh, is about the nature of information. Uh, a throwaway word, one word that, like the word art, means so many different things to so many different people um, information is uh, a fundamental aspect of, in physics, of a uh, fundamental aspect of the universe uh, in some ways that are poorly understood. It's also fundamental to the origin of life. All living things sense, communicate, may even uh, store memory and reproduce uh, information and uh, and communication. So information is much more than just human speech, imagery, AI, computing. Im information surrounds us. We live in what some people refer to as the noosphere, uh, like the biosphere. In fact, both noosphere and biosphere uh, were words and concepts coined by Verdansky, uh, Russian Soviet scientist long ago. Um, and uh, today, this session, a conversation with brothers and photonic futures, it's sort of a two-part program. Last April, I was in New York City, and I made an appointment to meet with Vinod Menon. Uh, I have a personal interest in, a creative interest uh, in photonics, uh, in light-based uh information processing, in communication, in uh, just an understanding of what is reality. Uh, and more and more in the sciences and in technology development, we're moving uh, beyond electronic communication, which has been a major underpinning of our computing technologies and our understandings of how to process information. Uh, we're now moving to, uh, in addition, not instead, but in addition to electronic communication, which actually gave birth to uh, digital logic and digital processing capabilities, Boolean, uh, uh, Boolean uh, logic, on, off, one, zero, either, or, if, then. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, digital logic uh, in so many ways has been applied to our society uh, and not just to our technology. And I think that's had some really uh, deeply concerning implications uh, in terms of people thinking of, of things uh, as good, bad, me, you, uh, uh, et cetera, thinking in binary terms rather than the richness uh, that lies between one and zero. Uh, and I think uh, in my own mind, photonics actually opens a, 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 a window, uh, a conceptual window into new ways to process information uh, because of the nature of light, uh, wave and particle simplistically stated, and, uh, uh, and also, as Leonard Cohen would say, uh, it light is uh, comes through the cracks. The crack is where the light comes in. And we're looking uh, today maybe to explore the light that's coming through some cracks in our society and our thinking. And uh, as I started to say, I, I met Vinod Menon at City University in New York at his lab last April. Uh, 
just as, as part of my own exploration of the photonic sciences and technologies. And we had very nice rapport, a nice Indian meal as well for lunch. And, uh, and we've stayed in touch. Coincidentally, uh, later that evening, that in April last year, after meeting Vinod, uh, my wife Jane and I went to dinner and we were joined by my distant cousin's son, Oscar. And it turns out, uh, I'm talking to Oscar uh, over dinner and Oscar says, uh, and I mentioned I just uh, spent the afternoon with uh, Vinod Menon. And Oscar says, oh, Visak Menon, his brother, is uh, my best friend. <laughs> and uh, coincidences like that make one feel like all's right in the world. One's in tune. Uh, and so I was very pleased. I've not in person met Visak yet, but uh, we've met virtually. And Visak produced the graphic poster image uh, that's been the title for this program. Uh, 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 Arts and Sciences Program on the Nature of Information. So thank you, Visak, for that. As we're talking about photonics um, in, a, in a few minutes, uh, and Visak and Vinod uh, are brothers, and uh, they, uh, I asked them to just have a conversation about art and science and information between brothers. We can start with that in a few minutes. Uh, I first want to also introduce August Muth, who I've known for a long time. I'm in Telluride right now. And August, many years ago, uh, lived in a little town of Norwood near Telluride. And we met uh, quite, a, quite a while back with a mutual interest and experience with holography, uh, making images photonically uh, with laser light and uh, some chemistry and some other processes involved that August will... Uh, talk to us about, but August is uh, involved in the exploration of light and photons as an artist and uh, and beyond being an artist. Uh, and I think that it's going to be really exciting and, and informative. So let's get started with uh, Visak and Vinod. Uh, it's, it's uh, you're on and let's, let's, See what if if these two brothers really get along at all. <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, thank you, Richard. That is such a kind introduction. Okay, are we good? Can we see my screen? Yeah. All right, Vinod, yes. if you want to get started, go go for it. And uh, I'll move the slides along. I'll join you as we talk. Sounds good. All right. So, yes. So, you know, when Richard first approached, uh, told us that he wanted us to do something together, uh, we thought this would be fun. But it was also a lot of fun thinking about the things that we had done as we grew up in India um, and, uh, you know, how both of us did do art and science in those days um, as kids as well. So let's move to the next slide, uh, Vishak. Uh, so as um, Richard pointed out, I am a professor of physics at City College in the Graduate Center of City University of New York. And the main theme of research in my group uh, is how do you control the interaction of light with matter, uh, specifically at the nanoscale where quantum effects get important. And Vishak? Hello all, uh, my name is Vishak Menon. I'm Vinod's younger brother. I am an artist and a graphic designer and I, the body of work that I make currently explores the aesthetics of error, signal and noise um, as a means to abstraction uh, to painting and drawing. All right. So just to give you both uh, all a quick rundown of, uh, you know, where we are from, uh, where we grew up and all of this, um, I'm going to let you know, kind of take it back from here. So we were both born uh, in the town of Kochi, which is a city in south, south southern state of Kerala in India. And um, 
both of us uh, started there. And a few years later, our parents moved to a town called Coimbatore, which is in the state of Tamil Nadu, which is in the border of Kerala and uh, Tamil Nadu. I went on to do a master's in physics in Hyderabad in 93, then a short stint in Pune at an astronomy institute designing telescopes, and then to UMass uh, in the uh, University of Massachusetts in 96, and then to Princeton in 2001 as a postdoctoral fellow. And around 2001, um, I finished my undergraduate uh, degree in uh, design, and I moved to the city uh, of Madras, now called Chennai, one of the major cities in South India. I started working as a designer in advertising um, for a few years, after which in 2005, I moved to Baltimore, Maryland for my master's uh, program at the Maryland Institute College of Art. And then we both uh, came back to met again in New York um, after a long stint of being in two different places. Vinod gets here to New York in uh, 2005, uh, around 2005 and me in 2007. And we both um, now live and work here. Vinod lives in uh, Manhattan, I live in Queens. And um, that's a quick little life story of um, you know where we are from and uh, what we've done in the past. All right, so this is, we wanted to uh, tell you a small story from uh, back in the day when we were both kids. Um, uh, and just again, showing our science and art background. So this is 1990 when I was still just finishing high school and um, Vishal was probably 10 years old at that time. Um, and uh, we decided to do something in the summer break, uh, which was, um, I decided to make a projector. Um, a homemade project out of shoe boxes and lenses. And Vishak decided to do drawings, um, stop uh, like a stop motion animation. Um, and we decided to make a movie and we invited all the kids from the neighborhood. Uh, we used my grandmother's sari as the uh, screen. And uh, we actually managed to attract a huge, uh, a good number of kids around to come and watch these movies. And I remember one of the movies that Vishak drew was Superman flying and crashing into things and so on and so forth. Um, so this was a, in one of our first forays where we collaborated and did something where he contributed to the art and I made the projector. So yeah. this is probably still our most successful collaboration uh, in terms of like actually something that we both have worked on uh, from our own different passion um, and what we both love to do. And I think, you know, it kind of in some very strange way set the path forward for both of us in terms of what we both do now and uh, love to uh, make. So, so now, which brings uh, us out of 2012, uh, and Vinod, I'll uh, let you take it on from Graphene here. Yes, so fast forward and around 2000, so 2010, um, Nobel Prize in Physics went to this um, new material that was discovered called Graphene, um, which was discovered in 2004. And in around 2010, 2011, um, it was discovered that not just graphene, but several other materials um, can be uh, removed using what is called the technique called exfoliation. So broadly speaking, when we take our uh, lead pencil, it's actually graphite, which consists of several sheets of carbon atoms stacked together. Now it was discovered that if you take scotch tape and um, stick the scotch tape onto this um, thick layer, and you keep removing it, then you will keep um, releasing these layers and you will end up getting very thin flakes of these carbon atoms or some other related materials. And so we started working on these materials. And um, it turns out, um, so you can see here, it's a video showing how you use a scotch tape. Now we don't use the 3M scotch tape, we use a special scotch tape, um, a blue scotch tape, which leaves less residue, but this is how it looks. So you remove the scotch tape and you can see these tiny black spots here. Those tiny black spots are actually tiny flecks of atomically thin uh, layers. So we're talking about less than a nanometer thick layer of materials. So you can see here in the bottom graph, bottom slide uh, pictures, the different thicknesses of these graphene layers and how um, you know, they form these uh, different thicknesses and different thicknesses give different contrasts. Okay, so why are we talking about this? Well, Vishak, uh, because there is another commonality that we just uh, hit upon without knowing each other was working on these topics. So Vishak? 
Yeah, so around 2011, 2010, uh, late 2010, early 2011, um, I had sort of made a uh, significant move uh, in my studio process from working exclusively on digital and video to working much more with uh, drawing and painting, uh, much more analog. And, you know, of course, coming from a digital and a design background, the, the, uh, uh, all of that uh, was still in play. But uh, here is the coincidence that sort of happened was I was starting to work with these mixed media collage works on paper. Uh, and I was kind of essentially looking for some kind of a material that I could collage that was not exactly pre-existing imagery, which is the expectation with collage. And uh, as luck would have it, one day I opened an old box of uh, charcoal and oil pastels, and in there was a roll of uh, clear double-sided uh, tape. And a lot of the pastel and the charcoal had kind of gotten stuck to the, the surface of the tape itself. And I kind of peeled it, looked at it, and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I can kind of start to like use the transparency and I can start to use the layering. And in by like 2012, I had started kind of perfected like how I wanted the process to work. And I'd started making the series of works called tape drawings. And uh, so one day I'm talking to Vinod and I'm showing him some of this new work um, that I'm making. And I'm very excited because, you know, uh, I have no idea what's happening in the world of physics. I don't know in, you know, 2012 graphene was uh, uh, a, a scientific discovery that had won the Nobel prize. And Vinod just goes, oh my God, this is the same stuff we do in the lab. And it's this thing called graphene. And so we then got talking about it. And, you know, I was telling him this was a complete accidental discovery for me. And I have been trying to kind of perfect, you know, how to use that tape itself with these transparent layers of, uh, in my case, charcoal, uh, pastels, pigment powder, dry paint. Um, you can see a close-up image here of some of the work. And you can see how the tape is like, layered with these materials and then collaged together with like a clear acrylic gel medium uh, to kind of all, all hold it in place. Um, and this was a series of work that was all titled Glitch. And essentially I was looking at um, the way that images get glitched, how the information gets degraded. Uh, but, you know, when uh, Richard was um, uh, mentioned to us about this conversation, we know then we got talking and we were like, okay, what are some of the other things that is kind of a commonality between our work? And we were the first thing that we both thought of was this, um, the graphene and the tape drawings, because in, in some ways they are very similar processes, but to completely different ends. And here's, I'm just rolling through some slides of some of the work from the series. These are all from... 2012, 2013, 14, um, all works on paper uh, made with the same process and from the same series. And then again, back to you, Vinod. Yeah, so um, so now going back to um, you know 1984 when I was uh, in middle school, uh, one of the projects I did was to um, make, a, make a box that traps light. And um, I was fascinated by the idea of light but I knew that it was not easy to trap light because you know it, it's always, as Richard rightly pointed out in the, in the great words of Leonard Cohen, it always escapes through the crack. Um, so I wanted to see, is it possible to trap light? And so I had the shoe box, I had a bunch of mirrors that my father got me, and I was trying to make this thing that makes light bounce back and forth. Fast forward now uh, to you know my current uh, research, and what I do is exactly the same thing. I'm making objects, just that I'm making them at the nanoscale to trap light. And these are called micro cavities, and I'll talk more about it in my next part of the um, you know, presentation. Uh, but the basic idea is that I'm trying to make objects where I can trap light. And the trapping of the light comes about through, uh, in this case, in the second case, through a phenomena like interference. So, um, And so uh, shown here is what is called a Michelson interferometer. Um, is a slightly modified Michelson interferometer, but you can see here um, what we are looking for is the interference that emerges when a system goes from that is incoherent to something that is coherent. So when that when I've said 0 0.75 versus 1.25, that's like a threshold um, number. So above one is above the threshold, and the emergence of coherence happens, and you can see this nice interference pattern. 
it's exactly the same interferometer that was used for the LIGO observatory, except that's a much bigger interferometer that is used to measure these kind of uh, interference phenomena. And you can see here on the right, and this uh, nicely connects to what August does, because what we have, the way we have created this interference pattern is by projecting a hologram onto a material which emits light. And then I can make these, and they create this state of matter called Bose-Einstein condensates, and then they interfere with each other, and I can create these beautiful patterns, and I'll talk more about it later uh, in my presentation. And which kind of brings me back to around, uh, you know, I, th I think this has happened a couple of times to the both of us where our interests have uh, independently gone off into areas which also overlapped um, uh, and we only realized it over time. So around the same time that Vinod uh, was kind of starting to work on some of this, um, I was kind of also going back to a little bit of digital work and uh, essentially looking at video signal manipulation, um, the idea of signal to noise and what that does to video. So I was essentially using uh, programs like uh, open frameworks, uh, that is coding with C++, or uh, touch designer um, and you know, uh, taking video signals and degrading the information to the point of uh, where there is, is there any more information left? And kind of looking at that interference as a starting off point or a stepping off point uh, towards abstraction, right? And as I was kind of thinking about all this and kind of still formulating the thoughts in my head and kind of working through the, uh, you know, what is the physical manifestation of it, um, I actually, I've seen this work by Namjoon Pike, uh, Magnet TV, 1965, uh, in books, but I had never seen it in person until about 2013, I think. Um, it was at uh, the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. They had this, uh, uh, this particular work. And, you know, this is a tank, like, this was something that kind of pushed me further towards thinking more about interference as a conceptual idea, uh, where what uh, Namjoon Pike had done was essentially put a giant magnet on top of a TV, and this is a very famous, well-known work. But uh, what I took away from it was, uh, you know, how do you look at interference as a phenomenon that can uh, lead to abstraction? And from there on, I sort of started working with this uh, new series of work that I still make uh, that is all called interference, and these are all uh, paintings and drawings. Uh, they're all made with uh, acrylic and uh, inks and either on paper or on wood panels. And the uh, the repeating lines are uh, very much a factor that plays into both how you see it in an image versus how you see it in person. Uh, the, the strange thing with these works is that there is a literal interference uh, in terms of, you know, when I finish these paintings and take a photograph of it, scale it down, compress it, and here it is in a slide presentation versus if you were standing uh, a foot away from this work on the wall, what you see from this work is very different in terms of how our uh, you know, uh, optics, our neural pathways kind of interpret this image. And uh, what was interesting for me here was the idea of, you know, when does, um, when what happens to images when they get to that point where there is no more anything obviously recognizable, you know, going back to what Richard said about the binary, right? Like just because an image is corrupted, does that make it bad? Is there an aesthetic value to uh, that information degradation for us to kind of step back from this information overload, uh, the world that we live in right now, and to kind of look at it as abstraction, but to also have a different point of view in terms of what happens when information reaches a point of collapse or if you know there is too much uh, noise to that signal. And um, these are all the sort of um, conceptual ideas that have given this body of work. Um, but at the end of the day, it's also very much about the rigor of abstraction, uh, a repetitive process of um, drawing lines with uh, paint markers and pens over and over and over. I'm scrolling through a few of the works from the series. Um, these are all from the last four to five years. Uh, which sort of brings us to the end of the, the first part of this, uh, a little bit about 
what Vinod and uh, me do and the sort of commonalities and differences um, uh, between our practices and uh, where we are at at this point. Um, and I think I'll open it up back, Richard, uh, back to you and uh, to the discussion and to August. Thank you, Visak and Vinod. And uh, yeah, let's just very easily transition to... Um, uh, Vinod, do you have a presentation? Yes, uh, I, I yeah. do, yes. Well, I, I guess that's the next step here then. Okay. We okay. will just move to that and uh, and then see what that fo what follows that. So go right ahead. Go ahead, yeah, you're on. Okay, great. All right, um, thanks Richard. Um, yeah, so um, I'm gonna talk now a little bit about the actual, uh, the science that we do in my lab. Um, and I'm from uh, City University of New York. And these are all the funding agencies that uh, make us do the science that we do. Um, just as a quick primer, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with where City College is, um, this is um, this is Central Park. We are north of Central Park right here. Um, it's a campus that's celebrating 175th year. This is the old part of the campus, um, the Shepherd Hall. If you've seen the movie Graduate, uh, what is shown as Harvard is actually this building here. Um, and this is the new part of the campus where we have our labs and uh, what's called the clean room to do nanofabrication and so on. So photonics, as um, Richard pointed out, um, is a very, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a key enabling technology um, today. Uh, it's uh, used in communication, computing, uh, storage, health, uh, sensing, display technologies, everything from your iPhone's OLED or phones, OLED dis organic LED displays to foldable displays. It's used in manufacturing where lasers are used for cutting, engraving, solar energy, um, and so on. So it's, it's very pervasive. And uh, really, um, one of the key things about photonics is how do we manipulate how light interacts with matter? So if you think about a beam of light that is coming into a medium, and you have some, in this case, I'm, I'm just talking about electrons, for example, electrons sitting in uh, the lower energy state, then when I, um, when the light goes through, because light travels so fast, only one of the electrons gets kicked out. But instead, if I put two mirrors on either side of this, and then I shine light, because the light is trapped inside this, between the two mirrors, I can make this light interact with matter much more strongly. So this idea of taking matter and putting it between mirrors where the light is trapped, lies at the heart of a lot of photonic technologies. How do we make light interact stronger? Because while light has all these advantages, it's massless, it travels uh, very fast. It, one big disadvantage is that it doesn't like to talk to each other. So the way you trap light um, is you put mirrors, as I showed you between two mirrors, you can make spherical mirrors, triangular, you can make them in an optical fiber, you can take them in spheres of glass, you can make them between mirrors like this, as shown here. Um, and in fact, these kind of uh, spheres uh, where the light is trapped along the equator are called whispering gallery uh, resonators. And this actually takes its name from uh, these famous, um, this famous um, institution, St. Paul's Cathedral, or the Grand Central Terminal, where both of which host what is called the whispering gallery um, resonator. So what happens is you uh, whisper at one side here, and the sound um, bounces around and comes back to the other side. So this is um, uh, so these kind of resonators where light is essentially trapped is a way to increase how light interacts with matter. And this is what we do in our uh, research. Now I want to bring up a few things about light that really fascinates me. Uh, the first thing I want to bring up is color. Uh, when we think about color and we think about the color of our clothes or um, you know or uh, shoes or uh, bag, bags and so on, it's usually pigments. So it's all some kind of a pigmentation that is giving rise to that color. But there is a whole different kind of creating color or, or a whole different technique of creating color and that's called structural color. So the idea is that you have something that has got some structure, which when light falls on it, it reflects and it only reflects certain colors and it only transmits certain colors. And these structures by themselves are colorless. It's only the fact that they are arranged in some periodic fashion or in a quasi-periodic fashion 
that creates these beautiful colors. So this is the morpho butterfly, for example, which has these beautiful colors. The morpho butterfly, if you look at it in reflection, looks like this. But if you look at transmitted light, it looks very different. The sea mice lives at um, in the very bottom of the ocean and hence has to be very conservative about using light. So it traps light using these tiny features in its cells where, and the light gets stay, uh, can be absorbed much more effectively. So there are all, these are all beautiful examples that nature has done through evolution where you can see all these beautiful colors. Now you can also do this man-made. Um, so you can see here, um, this is an example of a peacock that where the structure of the peacock has these tiny features here. Um, and ju just to give you an idea, these features are about 100 nanometers to 200 nanometers. So that's 10 to the minus nine zeros um, uh, uh, meters, uh, 100 times 10 to the minus nine, uh, 10 to the minus nine meters is the size of each of these objects. And now if you change the color size of these objects, you can get different colors in reflection. Just to give you an example, um, I have this, We made in our lab, which I'll play it once. So, after the change, the random is going to be different color. So, this is very similar to what happens when you see a uh, oil on a puddle of water, where you see the different colors. That's interference. It's thin film interference. Except we are now accentuating this process using multiple layers of the structure or multiple um, uh, multiple periodicities of these tiny pillars of in this case, silicon uh, nanostructures. Okay, so this brings us to a question. Um, so light is fantastic. It's got all these amazing properties. But one thing light does not like to do is light doesn't like to interact with each other. So I often joke that lightsabers do not clank. And so if you wanted lightsabers to clank, what you need to do is to imbibe on them some property of matter. So how could you do that? Well, this is one of my, the main topics of research in my lab. We work on what are called, um, uh, these are quasi-particles, so these are not real particles. These are um, an excitations of matter and light, and they take on the properties of both. So just to illustrate this idea, let's um, look at this. So this is my matter sitting here, and this is light that is trapped between two mirrors. And in this case, the matter is sitting in the lower energy states. Now I'm going to uh, turn on this uh, video and you will see what happens. The matter goes up, it absorbs the light. When it comes down, it emits the photon and it goes back and forth between absorbing a photon and emitting a photon. And then this keeps happening more and more. And at some given time, it's impossible for you to distinguish whether the state of the system was in the light state or in the matter state. And so what you've really created is this uh, transient qua uh, quasi-particle, which has got properties of both light and matter. And this is fantastic because the matter component gives you everything that electronics provides. Like, um, you know, they like to interact with each other. You can make transistors and so on. But whereas the optical component or the light component may gives it the small mass, um, the large uh, coherence of it, and it can propagate long distances. So these quasi-particles are called polaritons. I know it's a jargon, but I just wanted to introduce this word to you. Um, in fact, if you Google the word polariton, the definition of polariton, it's a hybrid quasi-particle formed by the strong interaction between light and matter. So that's, um, you know, uh, the, that's what these quasi-particles are called. And you can think of these quasi-particles as some kind of a glue that is between, where light acts as a glue between different materials. So again, here, um, what we have are two mirrors, and then um, there is these two different materials sitting in here, and the light is the thing that acts as the glue between the two materials. So um, you can see this um, this cartoon kind of illustrates that idea. And now I want to um, show you another phenomenon. So we talked about structural color, we talked about the emergence of quasi-particles, and then we identified the use of these light that is trapped between the mirrors as a way to um, glue multiple different objects. Now I want to talk, um, introduce an, a concept where one gets an emergent properties from these quasi-particles. But to illustrate that, I have, a, um, I have an animation that's taken from this lecture demonstration. 
Yeah. I just want to make sure that the sound is audible. Is the sound audible? So we have a set of metronomes that are all out of sync with respect to each event. And the person puts the metronome on top of two product end and gives it a slight back, which starts moving these metronomes. And you can see what happens here. They all fall in sync. So what we've done is we realize a collective behavior. And the collective behavior is happening because of this underlying modulation or this wave that I have introduced underneath. Okay, um, I just saw a comment that you couldn't uh, hear me. So I'm just going to repeat this. Um, so I'll just. Um, reduce the volume of this um, when I play it so that what I have are a set of metronomes that are out of sync and then just because I have this underlying uh, movement of this uh, whole platform I have made all the metronomes sync with respect to each other and they've all fallen into phase. So this is like a collective phenomenon. Now it turns out that um, I'm going to pause this now and move the. Okay. So what I'm showing here are um, what are called Bose-Einstein condensates, are and which are collective phenomena where these quasi particles that I introduced to you earlier in the presentation um, all come and coalesce with respect to each other, and each of these pods. Uh, is a collective uh, excitation. And so I have a set of collective excitations which are all in sync with respect to each other as well. And it's in fact because of that that I can see this interference happening between these spots. If you uh, look carefully, you will see the interference patterns that emerge between these. The way we realize this is we send a laser beam onto a what is called a spatial light modulator, project a hologram onto this uh, cavity structure, and we get this lattice of these condensates, which are all talking to each other through uh, interference phenomena. And um, this collective phenomena happens between all of these lattice sites. So you can create periodic uh, structures, quasi-periodic, you name it, we can uh, do these. So this is, um, you know, we're studying some fundamental physical phenomena using these. Uh, but it turns out, um, since the theme, overall theme is information, um, another interesting aspect of this uh, thing is that uh, of these lattices of these polariton condensates is that I can actually use it for computation and specifically analog computation. So these are not binary, these are analog. And the way we do this is we take a handwritten digit, we project it onto a, in this case, like it's like a uh, your projector, and then we superimpose that with the laser, and then it falls on this cavity structure that I was telling you about. And then the light that comes out gets detected by the CCD, and our charge coupled device camera. And then we send it to a, a computer where we train the computer based on the images that it's observing. And it's analog device because it relies on this kind of a response function like your neuron. So it's like a neural network. A uh, re response function of your, this cavity looks like this. And this is what allows us to train these systems to recognize handwritten digits. So something very abstract to something that's very practical where I can actually do uh, image classification and digit classification using these uh, polariton condensate lattice. Um, another topic of interest for me has always been, um, while we use light to study matter and we use these hybrid quasi-particles to um, you know, modify some of the properties, I've always wondered whether we can use light to modify matter. And in fact, we've seen this. You can, you can burn objects if you focus with a magnifying glass uh, we can do all sorts of thing, um, things with light, like you know, lasers are used for cutting and so on. So if you tone this down a little bit, then you can ask, if I shine the right frequency of laser, then the matter starts vibrating. And because of this vibration, can I change the properties of this material? So people are interested in things like superconductivity using these approaches. 
uh, one of the things we have done in my lab is to make an uh, to realize uh, we came up came across this material which is a pretty exotic material called chromium sulfur bromide. Um, it's it's a, again a material that can be removed by Scotch tape technique. But what is fascinating about this material is, in its natural form, light is trapped inside this material, and because light is trapped inside this material, the intrinsic properties of this material is a collection of light and matter. And what is nice is because it's this hybrid state of light and matter, I can modify the response of this material, in this case, magnetic field, by tuning how light-like or how matter-like this material is. So this state of uh, system is uh, caught between whether it's light-like or matter-like, and we can actually control how light-like or how matter-like it is. And based on that, you can modify how this ma material responds to um, uh, something like, the, in this case, a magnetic field. We also work a little bit with uh, the quantum properties of light. So in this case, single photon emitters. So something that emits only one particle of light. And the way we do this is we take these atomically thin materials, put them on top of pillars, tiny pillars shown here. And you see how the mat, this atomically thin material wraps around like a tablecloth. And it strains, it introduces a very high degree of strain at these points. And the strain essentially causes single photon emitters to get produced there. And each of these sites act as single photon emitters. And the telltale signature of a single photon emitter is, if I have something that emits only one photon, when it comes here and hits a beam splitter, it sp splits, the photon either goes this way or this way. And when you detect the two, you detect it, that you get a click either here or here. If I was looking for the wave property of light, that wouldn't be the case. But here I'm looking for the particle property of light. And now what I would see is that at zero time delay between the two detectors, I get a second order correlation, which is very low. This is called anti-bunching. Um, but it suffices to say that it, this is a way to test whether the way I've created these wrinkles create space time, uh, uh, create something that creates single photon emitters. So I'm actually just looking at single photon emission, but this dip in my correlation curve indicates that I do have a single photon emitter. The last topic I want to briefly mention is uh, another area that we have worked on is metamaterials. These are materials that do not exist in nature, hence the word metamaterials. And it turns out uh, the big interest in them in the early days was, can we create cloaking using metamaterials? So again, a way of manipulating information. And the idea is that you have a material that sits around you, it's your cloak, and the cloak bends the light around in such a way that for a person who's standing here, it looks like the ray of light just came straight through as if you did not even exist inside here. So what is required is to curve space in a way so that light just bends around and goes, right? So we, we worked on these kind of materials, artificial materials, where we take, in this case, two different materials, silver and glass, we stack them up, and it creates these kind of effective medium where light sees when light falls on it, if light is coming perpendicular, it looks like glass. If it's coming parallel, it looks like a metal. And what that does is it changes a property of the matter where it goes from something that looks like an ellipse to a hyperbola. But you know, you cannot go from an ellipse to a hyperbola straightforward. You need to introduce something called a singularity. And the this is a cartoon that or an animation that shows what happens as the system goes from ellipse to the hyperbola, the density of light that gets trapped inside this matter gets hugely enhanced. And this idea of hyperbolic metamaterials is now used um, by us and others to create light emitting emitters, um, light emitting diodes. And again, within the uh, theme of information, one of the things that we are fascinated about is whether we can use the light in our rooms the LED bulbs as also information carriers um, and send out, send down information instead of your Wi-Fi router. Can they use uh, work as your Wi-Fi router? But the only requirement is that the LED has to turn on and off at a rate which is really fast to carry this information. Our eye will not perceive them turning on and off because it's happening at a much faster rate. But we could probably do this if we can turn on and on off the LED pretty fast, and that's usually not possible. But we do think these metamaterial structures that we have made are, is a path towards realizing these ultra-fast LEDs and what one calls Li-Fi 
or light based um, uh, Wi Fi networks. So, with that, I want to thank uh, all the people in my group who make all of this happen. Um, I do most of the talking, um, and these are the students who do all the uh, research. Um, it's a very, um, we have students from all over the world um, coming to our group. Uh, this is a slightly outdated picture. Uh, this is a more recent picture from our uh, last holiday lunch um, at one of our favorite uh, Chinese restaurants nearby. And uh, I want to thank uh, Richard for this opportunity. This is a photo taken from Richard's visit last uh, April uh, and Jane's also here. And this is my um, grad student who was with me at that time and she's now at Maryland, and uh, Sarah. And thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions and we can continue this conversation. Thank you, Vinon. Uh, I, I just, uh, that last image you just showed from last April um, included a friend that came with us to your lab. Yes. Uh, which relates uh, greatly to Vsock's image of Namjoon Pike's magnet on the monitor because uh, that gentleman is in charge of the Namjoon Pike and Shigeko Kabota uh, archives. And in fact, uh, we, I was in New York, in fact, to do a presentation at the Namjoon Pike loft. Uh, <laughs> at the, so we're just full of coincidences. Small here. world, small world. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, But uh, I think this has been a good uh, background to introduce August, Augie to me, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the stage is yours, August, uh, and I hope you can meet this high bar of presentation here. And, oh, I uh, won't meet the high bar, but we'll have fun. That's what we'll do. <laughs> thank so, you. So thank you, Richard, for inviting me to this presentation. Um, I think... Uh, what I'll be doing is showing uh, some of my artwork in video form, which doesn't really explain it very well, but you'll have a sense of it. My work is very experiential. And so it's very important to really experience uh, my work. And so that's, let's see where we are. We're gonna start something up here. We'll see if this works. There we go. So this piece is titled Zero to One Nanoseconds. Uh, it sort of uh, was the beginning, the source of all, all of us and, and what we are, uh, the Big Bang. And so uh, what I do is I coat emulsion onto glass. It's a, it's a light sensitive emulsion that was actually developed in 1850 and uh, used for for photography, uh, but it has a lot of properties that weren't very uh, good for photography in that it has a very slow speed. So some of the very first photographs you have seen, the buildings are clear, but the trees are wavy and there's no people in them. And that's basically the same emulsion that I use for making holograms. One reason I use that emulsion is because it ex is an extremely high resolution emulsion. Um, and uh, you know, if you could digitize a hologram into a pixelation form, it probably has about 10 billion pixels per inch. High resolution, much, much higher than anything we're really used to in, in the human scale. So I really talk about my work and, and really I work within the realm of the photon. So this piece, um, we'll start it up again. And uh, what I did is I coated emulsion onto the glass and you could sort of see the splatter of the emulsion coming out. This is a photoluminescent pigment that is laminated behind the hologram. And so uh, when it, this piece is in the dark, it glows in the dark, uh, the, 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 the circle. Um, um, the color that I get is derived from uh, basically structural color. So uh, all of the uh, all of the structure is is from a, a structure that exists within the emulsion when uh, the hologram is created. So and it's all in the nanostructure of of light. 
So when that little micro terrain that's in the emulsion is, we'll see if we can, okay, so we went on to the next one. So, so I'm influenced a lot by the, uh, the phenomenon of nature. This is basically a photograph of sunlight and ice crystal forming all sorts of different uh, optical uh, you know, uh, structures within the atmosphere that we can experience. Um, and so I'm always keeping my eyes open for things like this. Let's see, there we go. And so here's sort of a map of all of those different things that are in that photograph. You know, and uh, there's no sun dogs in this one really, but there are all sorts of different forms that exist. And um, it's, it's part of the beauty that we live in nature and how light interacts with what we can experience. And so the, the, this series of work was basically influenced by that. It's the Halo series. And so uh, as this video will run, I, I, basically right now this hologram is illuminated with a single light source. And then halfway through the video, there are two additional light sources that are added to it. So within a hologram, when you have uh, it's a, a hologram, it's a relationship between the light, the hologram, and yourself. So if, wherever the hologram is, you will see a perspective of, of what the hologram is. And so as there are three lights added to this, you will see more rings sort of accomplish uh, a, a, a pattern similar to the previous uh, solar patterns that we saw on the mountaintop. And so this blue circle projects about uh, nine or 10 inches off the surface of the, of the glass. And it exists in that space. It's, it's not an illusion. Um, a lot of people think of holograms as illusions and true holograms are not illusions whatsoever. They are you know, accurate light recordings of uh, interference of how light interacts and interferes with material uh, subject matter. So this piece uh, is called acceleration. And that greenish square that you see actually projects quite a, about nine, 10 inches off the surface of the, of the glass. The, the, the white and, and sort of yellow color rectangle <clears throat> is about nine inches behind. And so what happens is these two uh, materials of light cross over each other. That blue veil that's in the front um, of, of light, it, it exists in this space and you can actually interact with it and walk into that space and, and, and pass through a veil of light that exists within a space. And what I call this is material light. This is light as material that we can interact with physically. Um, and so holograms are the only thing that I know that is able to do this. And that's why uh, one reason I got involved with them many, many years ago. I've been making holograms since about 1980. And uh, they're just, they're magical, really magical. And they have this character of, of wonderment that is projected into people's uh, soul. And that's the, the one one of the most powerful things that I feel about holograms, especially my work, because I use very simple forms. In my early days, I used to do very pictorial work. I used to make three-dimensional pictorial sculptures and make holograms of it. And, you know, it was a hologram of something that you could recognize as, as a, uh, an image. With this new work, I started all of this work probably 1997, 96 in that time. And since then, I've been using very simple forms in my work simply to get people more involved in who light is and also what light is, but especially who light is. Because, you know, light is our origin. It is the creator of the universe. 
And so, you know, to become closer to light, we can actually maybe survive as, as, a, as a culture. Uh, without it, you know, we use light on all different levels. Right now we're using a lot of lower level light, a lot, burn a lot of oil, things like that. But we can use light in a very evolved way. And that's where the three of us are all going right now in terms of the work that we're doing is trying to understand light, which is pretty much a mystery. We really, you know, it, it, it acts like a wave sometimes, it acts like a particle sometimes, sometimes it acts like a plasma, and it does all sorts of crazy things, you know, that, uh, that we can talk about hopefully in a little discussion after, after my presentation. So let's see if we can get this video to work. It's, there we go. So that blue green rectangle is out in space, out in front. And as it cross over, you can see how the colors mix. And so that, those are structural colors that are mixing to produce the different colors of, of the, the rainbow. This is uh, acceleration uh, number nine, which is another series of work. And what I do with this is, uh, this is a layer of three holograms, uh, one on top of another. And, and what I do is I scrape away certain areas of the emulsion to allow you to see the a hologram behind it a little bit more interest, with more interest and uh, adds a, you know, a, a dimension of a composition uh, in the piece. Let's see if we can get it going. So as you can see, there's a little long rectangle sort of in the middle. That's not really a very deep hologram. It's only about a half inch deep, but the other two have about a dimensional volume of about uh, 18 inches altogether. And so as you move around the piece, there's a lot of interesting dynamics that can take place. And uh, once again, you know, a video does not really represent these very well, but it's the best we can do. You have to see it in person. So this piece is, uh, what I've done here is a layer, two holograms on top of one another. But before I did that, I scraped away a lot of the emulsion because the definition of a hologram, part of the definition is that it is, uh, the information is recorded of the whole all over the entire plate of the hologram, all over the entirety of it. Whole message is what, what the Greek translation means as, as hologram, whole writing or whole message. And so what I did is with this piece, I tried to scrape away as much emulsion away as so that you could, it was sort of abstract itself into something that was much less discernible as, as some sort of form. The video actually works better in terms of recording this as two ovals, whereas the hologram is much different. The hologram, when you see the hologram, it's way more abstract than this as you move around it because of how the different sections of the hologram interact with each other. And uh, it creates, you know, sort of, uh, people get dizzy when they see this piece. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of parallax in my work. So as you move, you know, left to right, wall to wall, you pretty much can see something in the hologram. And what I did for these, there's also lines that I sandblasted into the glass on this piece to sort of diffuse the hologram even further um, and, and to hide you know, the, the image in one sense. With the, the video, it actually records it fairly well. Uh, so on this piece, uh, what I did was, uh, this is, I sandblasted Behind the hologram, those, those sort of curved pointed shapes are sandblasted behind, behind the hologram and they're filled with a luminescent pigment. And then I laminated uh, two holograms together and the top hologram, which is the blue hologram, 
is done on very thick glass. And so when I finished this piece, what I did is I curved the edges of the piece and you can, it's basically, it's, it's a halo. It's a circle, the blue is a circle when it was a hologram. But what I did was curve the sides of it, creating a lensing effect. And so as you move around this piece, the lenses on the side distort and, and, and create a, a very interesting um, interface between the viewer and the light. And you can see as you get to the edge with you know the uh, the oval the oval in the center, it will um, blur into the spectrum because what it's doing is it's spreading out the spectrum of of the light that is being reflected by the hologram because that hologram is pretty much reflecting a a full spectrum of white, and so when you do that and you spread that a little further, you're going to have a rainbow. Um, so this piece is, has some luminescent pigment in it. It's part of the spherical light series. And it really is about color changing. You know, as you move from left to right, it goes through quite a bit of color change. And uh, that's, that's an important part of that piece. Let's see if we can, see if it plays it again, yeah. As you see right there, you know, it's, oh, well, we're on to the next one. So uh, this is also part of the spherical light series. And this one is even more extreme in terms of the left to right color change. And it's all about structural color uh, and the structure that exists within the gelatin of the hologram. And so but depending on what angle the light enters, that structure, the, the structure sort of acts like a Venetian blind. And at one angle, it gets closer together. And so it's going to reflect a, sh a shorter wavelength of light. And at another angle, as you move around, that Venetian blind of that, of that structure is a little further apart. So it will reflect a, a longer wavelength of light. So we're on the short wavelengths of light over on this side. And as it moves over, it'll go through into white, and then it'll be into a green line in the end. And this piece is, you know, has been, uh, I love this series of works, Spherical Light, because really light in its, in its true nature is spherical. It, 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 uh, it leaves the point of origin in a spherical manner and, and, and carries with it time and space as it moves through at 186,000 miles per second. So it's, it's sort of an amazing material to work with. Um, I, you know, I feel very fortunate that I'm able to, to work with lasers, to work with uh, laser light and to work with time and space all in all sort of wrapped up, up into one. And, really work with color. My work is really about color in, in the extreme. So this is where I make my hologram. So this table weighs about 14,000 pounds and it floats on inner tubes to isolate it from vibrations in the ground. Um, uh, during the process of, of making a hologram, if anything moves more than about a 10 billionth of an inch, the laser light that's interfering with the subject matter goes out of phase and you don't get anything. It's not like a photograph where you get a fuzzy photograph. It just goes out of phase and it just totally disappears into nothingness. And so, uh, you know, any sort of motion or, or, you know, energy input into the process of making a hologram, we don't make a hologram. So that's why you need such a massive table. I have, you know, I have five holographic tables that I work on but three for the most part that I really focus my attention on because I have found that they, 
they work the best out of all the tables. I have some, you know, very uh, high end optical quality tables. Uh, this is the best one. It's the heaviest and it works better than any Newport table with any sort of legs around. So it's pretty interesting. Um, here is a basic setup of how, how I make a hologram. So the subject matter is that, that circle that, that you see, or that oval in the, in, in the center of the photograph. And then what I do is I, I make holograms in a very simple manner. I, the laser emits the light, it comes to a mirror. I, take the, I, I reflect that light up to a concave mirror that's on a pole in the middle of the, you know, on the, in the middle of the building, on the side of the building inside. And that concave mirror acts as a lens and just spreads the light out. Now, a lot of people who make holograms, they like to make things, uh, they like to use equipment that, is, that uh, filters the light and, and sort of purifies the light. I don't really like to use those things because they, it loses the texture, it loses any sort of materiality that the light can have within the hologram. So I try to keep things very simple and also doing this, I can make a lot of holograms because what I do is I have uh, you know, a number of tables and I have different setups on different locations around on, uh, around the, on the tables and I have a set of uh, mirrors on a post. So what I do is I, reflect the laser beam up to uh, one of the concave mirrors down to a certain location, location and I can make that exposure there. Now, my exposures usually are about seven minutes long because of the long duration of the uh, uh, needed to expose this, this very slow photoactive material. Um, I use uh, diode lasers at 532 nanometers uh, argon lasers at 488 uh, for the most part, and also argons at 453, uh, I believe it is. But um, all in all, it's a very labor intensive adventure that is totally non-digital, uh, other than the controls for one of my lasers is digital, but other than I have lasers that are not digital whatsoever, and they just, it is a tube of gas that is, uh, electrified and as the as the atoms inside that tube start to vibrate and move they 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 uh, one of the atoms will leave one of the the atoms of gas behind and, and and connect with another atom next door and when that happens light is emitted and so it's very similar to the Aurora Borealis in terms of of how light is created so I feel very fortunate that I'm able to really you know, work in the realm of the Aurora Borealis often. And um, being in light is a, is a very enchanting place to be. Uh, here's just another way of working with light. Uh, this piece was basically illuminated with fiber optics um, from this uh, light source. And uh, this is the title of this is Q2. Uh, uh, What's the name of it? I forgot. Love, love, uh, love joy. Q2 love joy, which I did this when that comet was passing through. And so the fiber optics were sort of uh, reminiscent of some of the feelings of orbits. Not that they were really orbits at all, because it's a very regular orbit that a, that a comet is taking. Um, but you know, the use of fiber optics was very interesting to watch how people interacted with the fiber optics and how they would touch it and move, move around uh, the optics. And, and at one point, the hologram on the left, um, you could take one of the fibers and put it right up against the fiber optic and you could basically see a little small version of the entirety of the hologram in the corner from that perspective of that hologram. And so this is something that's really you know, sort of mind stretching in terms of just understanding what a true hologram is. Um, there, you know, these days there's a lot of things that are called holograms that have nothing to do with holograms, but that's the world we live in. So, um, you know, take your time and really decipher 
what what a hologram is and you'll start to understand the beauty that it, it exists within the phenomenon of wave interference and a hologram. So this is a video of a Michelson interferometer that uh, there were some, um, some talk about earlier. Um, and what I've done is I've taken a krypton laser, uh, a green laser and a blue laser and, and sort of put together a interferometer on, on my big table and ran the three beams through all the beam splitters. Here's the beam splitters as they're going through and overlapped the output from all of these beam splitters. And you get these incredible, beautiful designs. Uh, it's a little jerky, but it, you know, in real life, it's pretty beautiful how it moves and changes and breathes. And, you know, as you, if you drop like a, you know, a rubber band on this 14,000 pound table, you can see how the laser light waves react to that little small amount of input into the, the table. Um, and that's the movement that I have to watch out for. So um, this is, this is the world of the photon. It's, it's, a, it's a very minute world, but a very beautiful world. And hopefully it will be a world that will be more in our future as we move on. So uh, it'd be great to have some discussion now about how we all interact with light and how we move through our, our um, practice of research and art making and just a, appreciation of light itself. Thank you. Thank you, Augie. Uh, and that, that was a nice gateway to our discussion. Uh, and I, I was making some notes about things I wanted to talk about and learn about uh, while you were talking. And uh, I don't know uh, where to bring these things in. Uh, one question I have is uh, for any of you, uh, uh, Vinod or August at least, um, is there a real difference between early tube gas lasers, argon, neon, et cetera, uh, versus solid state lasers now, where you can have, uh, you know, so many laser sources on a tiny little chip, in fact. Uh, what, uh, what's the difference actually in terms of the phenomenology, the applications between uh, those different technological uh, lasing cap uh, technologies? Vinod. Uh, audio. Okay. I'll let August answer first since he's used lasers <laughs> before me. <laughs> well, st stability. Fast lasers. Um, yeah. Stability is always an issue with with lasers because they, you know, I, I talk about happy lasers and unhappy lasers. And when you have an unhappy laser, you it doesn't make a hologram. And so, you know, I'm, my, some of my exposures are, you know, even even 12 minutes long, but seven minutes long is a real average. And um, and that I'm using a lot of laser power. I have an 18 watt 532 laser. So it's putting out a lot of energy, but in that period of time, it hardly has to become an unhappy laser at all. And you get pretty much nothing. I have found gas lasers are more stable than solid state lasers just because you know there's there's a much longer warm up time so i i let my you know gas lasers warm up to you know three and a half hours usually till they're thermally stable and then and then you sort of i have to work with them and they'll be happy for about an hour and then they'll go down happy for about a half an hour one one of the lasers they all have their different personalities you know and one of them will get unhappy and then it'll come back to being happy you know i have a you know a a uh, a, a basically a spectrum analyzer for lasers. And so I can track it and get a good idea that it's, it's a happy laser. But even when the equipment says it's a happy laser, not necessarily because sometimes the hologram says, no, I'm not happy today. And it just, there's some sort of wave interference that just doesn't happen. Sometimes you get these amazing wave interference phenomena that happen in the hologram 
that happen I've only seen once, you know, and these amazing things happen. And it's like, okay, we're keeping that one. And I'm using that in a piece for sure, because it's a, it's a moment in time. It's a, the hologram is, is in, in my view, recording that moment in time, because as you illuminate it with another light source, that light source is being reconstructed and it's a, it's a, it being reconstructed into that period of time when that hologram was made. You know, uh, uh, a few years ago, I wrote an article talking about Bruce Nauman and some holograms he made in 1968. And they were using a pulse laser, which is a very short uh, pulse of laser energy. And so you can make a hologram of a person because in the seven nanoseconds of the, uh, the, the, the uh, exposure, the blood moving through the body doesn't move your body more than a 10 billionth of an inch. And so at the same time, this laser light went into his skin and was reflected out back into recording. And it's a real possibility that his, his DNA is recorded in that hologram. Not that we can see it right now, we have no way of reading it, but all the numbers line up in terms of the density of information and resolution that there could that though that information could be recorded in that hologram. So that's the that's the level of the photon, uh, you know, that is just remarkable that we all sort of have fallen in love with. I'm sure, the, you know, just makes you smile all the time when you think about it. Yeah, I, I think in science, uh, well, Richard, uh, you know, there's been a huge evolution of lasers in labs. Um, you know, there were gas lasers, there were these things called dye lasers where people flew, uh, flow dye, fluorescent dyes in there, messy to work with. And uh, now there are solid state lasers, which are made large ones made from crystals called titanium sapphire crystals, which are very uh, people, in, there are companies that have made very stable ones, especially for atomic physics. And even the diode lasers, which are very cheap now, but as August rightly pointed out, they're not as stable. But even there, there is some push towards making them more stable and so on. So, and then there's a whole class of lasers now called fiber lasers, which are essentially, you have a pump that pumps a large coil of optical fiber, and then it produces uh, actually a white light laser. So it's called a supercontinuum laser. So you just put in one color and you get a entire white spectrum out of it. So, so there's, there's all these uh, solid versions of solid forms that have come out now. The so, late, white white laser light is quite beautiful. It is. It is exactly. beautiful when it comes it's out. Like, you know, I've taken my argons and, yes. and kryptons and, and diode lasers and mix them all together and get these amazing colors. Yeah. So, so now with the optical fiber, what happens is you're just sending one color in, which is uh, in the infrared. And because of a process called nonlinear process, it stretches the pulse in colors. And what you get out of it are all the colors. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's really beautiful. Um, yeah. Great. So a few years ago, three years ago, I think, uh, Anton Seilinger and colleagues uh, got the Nobel Prize for their work. I, I visited that lab in Innsbruck long ago. And... Uh, and and I was fascinated with that. Uh, uh, you know, can you talk a little about those experiments and and sure. so um, what uh, Richard's alluding to is Anton Zeilinger, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on entangled photons. So a quick primer on entangled photons or entanglement uh, in general. The idea is that you create uh, two particles at a given location and they move apart, but their properties are. If, for example, one is polarized in one direction, the other one is polarized in the uh, perpendicular direction, and they flow apart. And if the act of detecting the state of one system seems to influence the other one. And this is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. Um, but it's not really, uh, it's only spooky action if you think of physics as being a local theory or quantum mechanics as being a local theory. But there is nothing that requires quantum mechanics to be a local theory. Um, local realism is something that we are all uh, wedded to simply because of our society and culture. Um, but non-locality is something that um, 
you know, one can, if one accepts non-locality, then there is nothing that says this cannot happen. So what Zeilinger and others have done is to demonstrate the sending of entangled particles of light, photons, at distances that are far apart. In fact, if I remember correctly, they it is between the two islands of Tenerife and uh, yes. I forget the other island's name. Um, they send it across and then they measure the entanglement between them and they show that these particles are entangled because it violates what is called Bell's inequality, which is a measure of the non-classicality of that uh, those two particles. Now, soon after, um, so uh, this Nobel Prize went to three gentlemen, Alan Aspe, um, uh, with Anton Zeilinger, and um, I'm blanking out on the third person's name. He's in Stanford, uh, he's in Palo Alto, who actually did the first experiments. Um, and all of them, what they showed was that these particles, when they travel apart, you can do this detection on two of them. And if um, it violates this inequality, then you know that they're entangled. And uh, when uh, Zeilinger did the experiment over these long distances, it was remarkable because it is showing that entanglement is sustained over, you know, sending signal through um, mm -hmm. atmosphere, for example, right? I mean, they were sending it between these two. Um, I, I think it was Tenerife and La Palma, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was the other island. Uh, but then uh, one of Zeilinger's postdocs, who is now in China, did this experiment where they sent entangled photon to a satellite and came back and establishing that you can actually do communication, information exchange via satellite with entangled photons. In fact, I would say that is what gave rise to the quantum race that's going on right now in the world. The moment that happened in China, it's like the Sputnik moment. But instead of space, it's the quantum Sputnik moment. That happened, and then there was all this funding for research in Europe and everywhere. I mean, a lot more funding. I mean, I won't say there wasn't funding. There's already funding, but there's suddenly a huge interest in this topic. And, and this so, also lies at the heart of quantum computing, by the way. Yes, and that, that's what I'm uh, leading toward here. Right. Um, in fact, uh, before we talk about quantum uh, probabilities, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I, I'm curious about uh, to just mention uh, LIGO and LISA and those interferometric sensing projects of gravitational waves, but uh, uh, photonics is a, a tremendous sensing technology. Absolutely. Just to think that it was able to detect something that minute. Uh, happening and uh, also matching two different measurements that is really impressive and I think that again interference um, it permeates the works of all three of us here um, and it is really lies at the heart of it and it's really that interference that gives us the ability to measure things much smaller than the wavelength of light much much smaller than the wavelength of light uh, and in fact they even did better than what they were able to do with LIGO recently where they used what's called squeezed light where they compromise on the uncertainty principle in one axis to get a higher resolution in the other axis. And using that, they were able to get better resolution. So, and also the mirrors used in the LIGO observatory, it's a work of art. Um, these things are made with thin films of materials that are stacked together. And it is so stable that it does, and it's hung by two tiny, um, strings, uh, it, it's a huge, there's a lot of technology that went behind those two mirrors to make them so stable. And and also, uh, I suspect one of the things I've been curious about, I mean, I understand uh, interferometry, and, and it's so fascinating. First time I ever saw laser interferometry, I realized uh, these uh, speckle patterns, uh, this these wave patterns that we're seeing when light interferes with light uh, is just chock full of information. And uh, and uh, to me, when I, I mean, I think I first saw that around 1970, uh, being an old guy now, um, but uh, I, I thought, oh, this is the future of language and communication. If we can only extract meaning from all of the noise that also is inherent to that process. And so I'm really curious about 
lasers and interferometry as a sensing medium and and for instance uh, LIGO or, or those projects what is the means of analysis of either digital or quantum analysis of that complex and dynamic signal uh, so, it, to it, extract meaning yeah one quick comment on that I want to mention is um Encrypting information using lasers was a, a hot topic in the 80s, and uh, you know optical computing was hot, um, and it's still it's now revived actually. Right now, there's a lot of interest in it, partly because of AI, uh, because um, the current computers the biggest problem is heating um, because of all the processing that happens. But uh, really, the question is um, what people were trying to do with encryption is to superimpose something on top of the actual data so that the whole data gets uh, scrambled. So actually a chaotic laser, so they send a feedback and send a chaotic laser onto it. The data gets scrambled, gets sent out. At the other end, you descramble it with a chaotic laser and you get your actual signal. So it's an interference process actually that you're doing uh, by superimposing the signal. Yeah, yeah. yeah so interferometry is a very interesting thing. Quick little story. I'm a surfer and I'm aware of waves and the, the interaction of the moon with waves. So full moon, you get bigger waves. That's just what happens. I gave up making holograms on full moon nights because it affects the hologram. A lot more movement, just there's, there's the tect tectonic movement is there and the hologram can detect that. Interesting. Fascinating. And, and so, a, again, just to a, a personal part, many years ago in the 1970s, and actually uh, in the coming days, we're going to have some presentations not related to this exactly, but uh, that have to do with plant and animal communications and actually use of AI now to augment our understanding of uh, the complexity of uh, bio signals of various sorts. Um, but many years ago, I did a project with a colleague here in Telluride, uh, John Lifton, uh, monitoring plants uh, using electrodes uh, and um, and creating a, a sonification, a music, a sound works based on some very simple metabolism of these living systems. Uh, not very rich information, just very, it's like listening to our heartbeat, uh, essentially. Uh, but I've always thought, what is, po is that possible to sense bio signals photonically? And how do you isolate movement uh, and, and all of that in that process? How can you do that uh, how can you work with living things, just as Augie mentioned, pulse lasers used to image living things that were breathing and heart beating and so on. Uh, is it possible to isolate or somehow uh, actually sense physiology, I mean, the way we do, do now with uh, electronic imaging technologies? Well, I have a friend in California who's been working on a system that uh, basically laser light enters the body. So a coherent collimated laser light enters the body. And as it exits the body on the other side, the laser light is basically reconstructed or reconstituted. And then you can examine that laser light and on a cellular level, you know, analyze the cells. That's the premise of this project. And it's 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 working in certain levels. It's coming. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, laser light is has the ability to hold a lot of information that we can read. White light mm -hmm. has the ability to hold a lot of information. We can only read some of it because there's so much there. So, but laser light is is it's much easier to to extract information from laser light. So, you know, it's coming. And I've talked with them recently and it's coming along and we'll see 
hopefully in you know 10 years we'll have a there will be a system out in the world that can evaluate us on a cellular level wouldn't that be interesting yeah 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 i mean there's so many applications beyond just barcode readers that people know about in the grocery store now uh, <laughs> uh, you you mentioned speckle right so yeah. when it propagates through a um uh, through a turbid medium like our body, for example, which has got a lot of scatters, and you get these um, speckles. And if you start tracing the movement of these uh, speckles and you map them, you get information about what's going on uh, in this um, random scattering medium, actually. So there's a whole field where people are looking at the statistics of the speckles. Exactly, exactly. I, yeah. For many years, I did uh, infrared thermographic imaging. Yes. Uh, uh, at, at uh, in the far infrared region, not the near infrared. Um, and for instance, if I would look at the human body with a thermal imaging system uh, that was good resolution, um, you can, if you colorize the uh, isothermic levels, uh, you can uh, get essentially a color contour map that's dynamic and result and it's non radi it's not uh it's uh it's not a radiating technology uh it's passive uh in a way and uh what was interesting to me was i was able to see temperature changes on the body but i was really curious about the emanation of heat and and such and respiratory uh, uh, exp expiration. Um, and there's a technique called Schlieren imaging that's used to see aircraft aerodynamic processes and but can can also see heat coming off of a black body, uh, black body radiation. And uh, but I was wondering, and I've always thought interferometry, and I remember many years ago, Augie knows uh, Metro laser. Uh, was doing large architectural engineering, stress monitoring using laser interferometry on bridges, on buildings. And you can do the same with the human body. You can actually image temperature and our, our thermal relationship to our environment using uh, these techniques. I mean, it's just, uh, there's so many applications just in the wings, just waiting, as Augie said, 10 years away, maybe even less. The other thing I'm thinking about, we only have a few minutes here, but I'm curious, I, as I was looking at Augie's images and B. Sox images, I thought, oh, there's a lot of uh, synergy here, different techniques, and yet, uh, you know, dealing with interference, dealing with color, dealing with image making uh, in a way. And uh, B. Sock, any thoughts? Yes, I was um, August when I was looking through when I was seeing uh, some of the work that you were showing. Uh, you know, I was thinking about how you are literally painting with light, right? Like you're you're like that that is that is your palette right there, and you're like That's kind it. of manipulating that palette. <clears throat> For me, sort of, it's uh, it's in a different place altogether. Where the images, the inspiration I'm looking at is all made of light because they're images on the screen. They're images of information that's degraded. But then I have to take it now into the land of real paint <laughs> where it's completely different systems, right? Like additive versus subtractive. Um, and so for me, the real challenge and the beauty of it is how do you sort of create paintings that have a quality that has that light to it, right? And you know, every time someone sees my work and they say, oh, it looks like a glowing screen from far until they get close to it and they realize it's just a whole bunch of hand-drawn lines mm -hmm. that is kind of making the opticals, it kind of you know, making you see it as light, but it's not. Um, so I thought that was, you know, um, but also in terms of process, I was seeing some of the stuff that you were mentioning, August, in terms of, you know, either sandblasting certain areas or like masking off certain areas. Um, and, you know, that is a, a, a huge commonality. I was kind of like that immediately put my ears up because that's something that I do a lot, which is masking off areas in terms of how I draw and paint and sort of approaching it in sections to sort of build up the composition. And that is completely abstracted. Mm -hmm. 
yes, for, you know, how people perceive. This is exactly. the question. How how do how do they see the work? How how do how do we all perceive it? You know, how do they perceive color? Yes. It's amazing how few people know about structural color. Yeah. And Vinod and me have talked about this, like I think like a few years ago, we both were kind of talking about this quite a bit. And I think um for me, the driver to it was um there was this paint that was invented that was the blackest black. It was called Vanta Black, and yeah. the British Indian artist Anish Kapoor sort of had the exclusive rights to this blackest black. And I was like, I should ask my brother about this. And so I go to Vinod and I was like, do you know about this black that like, you know, basically it absorbs nine, 98, 99% of all light, that it almost appears flat. And he was like, oh, we make that in the lab. I could make some for you, right? Um, uh, but, you know, the perception of color is definitely something where I think August with your work too, you know, looking at a video of it on a Zoom call versus the physical experience of viewing the work standing in front of it, um, which to me is also a huge deal because when my work gets re-photographed, compressed and scaled down into a slide, right. um, essentially there is a lot of information that is now being decimated down where those lines are now just big patches of color. And this happens also in person when, let's say if you're standing like 10 feet away from a painting on the wall versus if you're standing like a foot away from it. What you see and what how you perceive those colors is you know, very different. And in terms of structural color, I remember telling you know, like, um, you know, artists can make you see any color that we want you to see, even if it's not there. And it doesn't have to be structural. We, we, we can trick you. We, we figured that out like, you know, a uh, hundred years ago. And now we have new tools to do it. And, you know, uh, tools that have existed for a while and artists taking it and manipulating it in new ways. Um, for me, it's very much paint and ink. Any, uh, any last comments? We're about to, I, I'm going to end by just mentioning some of the upcoming uh, uh, Zooms in the next few days, but Augie, anything you wanted to talk a bit about the crazy things that you know, just you know what light is. It's we really don't know what this stuff is. You know, it acts as a particle sometimes. It acts like a wave sometimes, sort of a plasma sometimes. It does this, you know, what is it? Is it mass? I believe it is mass. In the holograms, when when you know that blue rectangle is in space and you can interact with it and move your face through it. It's there. It's material. It's not an illusion. And it's it's amazing to to see how people interact with that. And and that you know that gets me going all the time. I just had a, some people over at my studio yesterday and you know they were just mesmerized. They you know they, they were in in wonder. And it's a different thing. So how do we get people into this state of wonder so that they can really expand their perceptions? Because that's what it, that's what wonder is, is sort of opening you up so that you can see the world differently, so that you can see the oil on water and see the colors in the structures instead of oil on water. Again, I always thought uh, photonics might, might not, but might lead to greater enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> so hoping, hoping, hoping. Yes, the, I think the computing is a very interesting and also the quantum side. Uh, the gentleman whose name I forgot was John Closser, who was the third gentleman who won the, uh, who was yes. the yes. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I think entangled photons are the way to go. Anyway, um, I want to thank you and stay on just for a moment while I uh, let people know that uh, tomorrow, Monday, uh, we have two sessions as we had today, uh, but the uh, earlier session tomorrow is with three physicists uh, talking about physics, information, and the origin of life. Uh, uh, Eric Smith, who will be connecting where he teaches uh, in Tokyo uh, in the summers. Uh, he's sometimes, I've met him at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, and he teaches at Georgia Tech as well. Uh, Eric is a brilliantly 
clear communicator about very complex physics and science and the the physics of information. Uh, and uh, he'll be joined by Edwin Valentin from Göttingen in the Netherlands. Uh, Edwin is also a astrophysicist uh, and uh, um, is in Göttingen and works with computer science, AI, and uh, astrophysics, uh, and is very involved and interested in the arts and in theater, and uh, just a brilliantly creative individual who every two years puts on a major conference called Information Universe uh, in, in the Netherlands. And he's also built and designed a major planetarium uh, at the university there that is the the site for the Information Universe conferences. Mm, really fascinating uh, program. And they're joined by Mark Nyrink, uh, who actually just arrived today here in Telluride. Uh, and he's a young cosmologist, a physicist, uh, who's working with uh, strings and other aspects of uh, webs in out in the, un in the structure of the universe and light in the universe and so on. So I think our physics talk and presentations tomorrow will be really fascinating. And we're also joined by Sean Brixey, who I thought might join us today. He's uh, He worked many years ago and studied uh, and worked with Stephen Benton at uh, MIT and at uh, Polaroid Corporation across the street. And uh, Sean will be showing some work. He's done some remarkable photonic artworks over a long time. And he, he's joined by Joshua Garland, who's in a completely other area of, the, of our exploration of information here. Uh, he's dealing with uh, the very difficult areas, the uh, political, social, cultural issues of disinformation and misinformation and information warfare which is pervasive and we hardly understand the depth and detail of information warfare. Actually, uh, much of Joshua's work is funded by Defense Department sources, DARPA and so on. Uh, so I think that's an important perspective that we want to explore in this series. Uh, and then we have some other uh, programs coming up on the sounds and senses of life, monitoring bio uh, signals, biocommunication, uh, and actually Matteo Rini is joining in that conversation. Matteo is a remarkable musician. He's part of an art and science group in Brooklyn, and uh, he's the editor of the uh, of Physics Magazine. The uh, he's a physicist by training as well as a musician and. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the AI applications to biosensing and whale communication, bee communication, uh, a lot of the work that's going on right now because we're able to parse through the incredible complexity of data that is inherent in that kind of work. Um, and uh, on Wednesday, we're joined by uh, presenters from Portland, Oregon, from the, uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands, and from Athens, Greece, on the economics of information, uh, especially the ecological economics of information. Um, how do we value, uh, I was mentioning in the previous uh, uh, laser Zoom session, that years ago I went to uh, the very, very first year of the uh, public internet, the beginning of the Clinton-Gore administration uh, in 92, 93. Uh, I went to a Department of Commerce meeting in Washington uh, where they were asking the question central to the future of commerce, which is, what is the new digital economy? Uh, and at the end of two days of, of meetings among government bureaucrats, corporate leaders, academics, they said, oh, and, and I was really, I, I was there as a guest and uh, I thought, oh, this is going to be fascinating because information, which is now in economic terms called an intangible and an externality, along with health and learning and family care and things like that, the things that are not material, uh, that actually are the basis for quality of life, uh, as opposed to material goods, which we know how to value. Uh, 
uh, I thought, oh, this is going to open up people's minds about understanding valuation of immaterial processes. Uh, and instead, they said, oh, no, 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 no. This is easy. Information is property. <laughs> to be bought, sold, regulated, rented, and uh, and uh, and that way we don't have to change patent laws. We don't have to change copyright. As long as information is property, it's just like material. It's just like plastic or uh, metal or any or land. Uh, I thought that was pretty awful, <laughs> but we're going to talk about uh, some other perspectives, uh, again, informed by things like Eleanor Ostrom's work. Uh, actually, I have to shut this down a moment, but uh, the information, uh, at least parts of the information environment as a commons to be stewarded and not just profited from, but to be shared and benefited by all you know, uh, shared wisdom and knowledge and uh, and community-based information, locally-based information that is different than global information and so on. So I have to end this here. I want to thank everybody. And we're done. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye. See you online. Yeah. <laughs>